draw whatever you want. Okay, and then take a pen that writes. <laughs> And cover your map with circles, make sure you overlap them. Otherwise you're getting too many empty spaces. And then in the next row, you go like this. And then depending on where you are, so if you are in the prairies, you take your van. If you're in Madagascar, you will walk or you take a boat or so. You start the first day in here or let's say over there, this is your circle number one, this is your circle number two, this is your circle number three, and so on. You go in, you find a field of the crop that you are working on, sit in there, you have a plastic container, and you collect all the insect specimens of the species you want to control into that container. And your container you label exactly the same way as your circle. So if in this circle, which might be pretty big, right, might be, I don't know, 100 kilometers, 200 kilometers across, maybe 50 kilometers, who knows, you might have sample, I don't know, 1 to 17. Does that make sense? So for each location within the circle that you find specimens, you give the pot an individual code. So in the first circle, you would have Everything like one one two one two oops one three all the way down to one seventeen. No, you're looking somewhat surprised. I'm not making sense. It does? I do make sense? Great. Just to know <coughs> the distance between one and two. Will be will be dependent on the biology of the pest. If they if they travel a long distance, then uh, the distance between your points will be bigger. If they don't travel a lot, then you'll have to get closer. And the idea is to because virus and insect develop a relationship rapidly, three generations. So if they don't travel, if you know within three years they won't travel the 10 kilometers. Well, you have to sample every 10 kilometers, a little bit like that. In interlocking areas, how would you label them? Depends really on how much you get done in a day. So if, if your circle is pretty, good, pretty big and you have done 17 sites in here all over the place, then you leave this part to the next circle. And you can identify that. Did you just have a question? I saw another I hand going up. Oh, OK. <laughs> Good. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, what you do then is, um, well, it depends a little bit on the situation. In, in Madagascar, we actually went back to the lab every two weeks because we didn't have a mail system where we could just take the samples and ship them to the lab. In Madagascar, in, in, in the prairies and in eastern Quebec, we just drop them off at the mailbox every once a week, you know, a big box of sample pots and ship them back. Um, whatever you do, however you do it, you have your pots and you take them to the lab. Now each of these pots has one of those codes and you can compare them to your map so you know exactly where you found it. If you, if, you, if you collect in BC, you can give an individual address to every field that you have been on. If you are somewhere in Madagascar or West Africa, you really just have to mark it on your map, make a dot and label your dot, because you don't really have the address system like that. Once you're in the lab, then all the larvae that are in one, in one container are homogenized. You make a cocktail, you just hold the blender in, and now you have a juice. Yes? Sorry, what went into that, the pot? You said all the samples from? From one location, so from one single spot. Oh, so. So you put them all into one cocktail. So sorry, I thought you had one insect per pot. So you just no, you have one pot per location. And in that location, you put all the insects you find 
not any species. Of the species you want to control, you put them all into one pot. Um, yeah, it could. Although 300 I would not want to have. And you will see why. So you have these samples. Was there another question? You have your pot. And let's say you have anything between, let's say, one to, I don't know, maybe 100. 50. Yeah. This is a scientific debate. <laughs> so either 1 to 50 or 1 to 100, you know. For me, it would be, I would say, if I can find within a certain amount of time 100 specimens, most likely there is not a very strong virus in that area. So if I find that many, this would for me become a sample I'm not very interested in, and I would have stopped sampling when I found 50. So I would never make it to 100. But there's you know, different scientific strategies in there. So these larvae are homogenized. And now I put them into an Appendorf. I put the juice into an Appendorf. And this liquid, this cocktail, now contains the debris of all those larvae who come from one location. Now what we do is we take 100 and so on larvae that we have raised in the lab. So they are somewhat here, a colony, a lab colony of this insect. You take 100 larvae and you infect them all with this juice. How do we do that? Pretty cruel. We just throw them in. <laughs> we are taking those um, containers like you have there, these, um, um, what do you call them? Guys, uh, plates. Yeah, or cell culture plates, you know, where you have many, many little containers on one plate. And you just put two or three drops, very, very few, of your suspension into the container. And then you throw your larva into these holes one by one, and you just let them swim in there. These insects, they need to defend themselves against rain on a regular base. So they all come with a reflex. You put a drop of water onto them, and they struggle really wild not to drown. Same thing you. You, you, you. you fall into the lake, you fall into the water, you don't know how to swim, you struggle really, really hard. What do you do? You swallow water, a lot of it. And they do the same thing. In the past, people did this infection a little different. They um, um, uh, mixed it with sugar to attract and had the larva crawl towards it and so on took a lot of time, and you don't really know if they really drink, and in the end they're very sticky, and then you don't know if they died of the sugar or they died of the virus. <laughs> so this was a lot faster and very efficient. So by once you have infected them, and it depends a little bit, um, the, how long you let them swim in there depends a little bit on the insect species. Some of them are quite resilient and put up an incredible fight. You might have to leave them in for a minute. Others, like diamond back moth, for example, second instar, they are so fragile. You know, give them, give them, I don't know, 10 seconds and then get them back out or you kill them. <coughs> so you don't want to kill them with your manipulation. You want them to swallow a virus that will then kill the insect. When you have them, they all go into those little solo cups individually. So you now have 100 solo cups. With, an, with a larva, with a treated larva sitting on diet. And now what we did was for the next 30 days, we opened every container once a day. And you get really, really fast at them. Open, snap, open, snap, open, snap, open, snap. And you have a sheet where you mark which larva are dead and which ones are fine. And over this 30 days in the end, what you do is you get a curve, right? Here are your days. Here's your N of dead larva. At the beginning, what happens the first day is just a test on how good were you in your treatment. Everything that's dead the next day most likely didn't die of virus, but died of your mistreatment. 
But let's say you did really good. That means on day one, you still have 100 larvae. And then you have different curves. Sometimes it goes like this. Sometimes it goes like this, which means there was simply no virus in your juice. Those one you can now throw out. Sometimes you, know, you have something that goes very rapidly. Sometimes it goes like this, you know, different developments. I must say, this one here, we hardly ever found. And I think that's because there is simply no population of anything out there that is not infected by a virus. If it is rabbits or, or humans or, or caterpillars or anything that is out there, we are all subject to viral, viral diseases. And we are the lucky ones. We have an immune system that can defend us. The insects do not are so rudimentary, they really can't fight a virus infection off. So it now can, from... It, it can be other diseases, by the way, as well. It could be, but very yeah. often, back, we didn't find many bacteria for whatever reason, so maybe the process itself is less good for bacteria screening. We found, uh, okay, Nozema. So the tough ones, they, they make it through. One, one reason probably why that is the case, that these samples here we kept at minus 20. Sometimes for a year or two, just you know, until we had the necessary funding to, have to, to hire the students to do that kind of stuff. The samples sometimes just have to sit in the freezer. And the, the bacteria and the fungi, they will mind that. The viruses, the bacteroviruses, they do not. So now what we did was typically we had 250 to 300 um, locations, meaning pots, meaning juices, right? And in the end, curves. You still with me? Didn't lose you? Okay. We didn't have the resources to test all 250 or 300 samples in terms of is there a virus in and how good is the virus? So we always chose the 100 most efficacious of those. And continued working with them. The rest we put in the freezer because we never threw samples out. <laughs> so what you want is a lot of freezer space. Um, of the 100 that have curves like this or this or even that, then what we did was we took the juice that we had left from this step and again infected 100 larvae. This time it was not to look how fast they died. We just let them sit there, so no job for students. And then homogenize the stuff again with the idea that by infecting those, we now had produced virus. So typically, for example, we would try to do this at L1 or L2 because we wanted them to die. This step we would do at something like L3 or L4. Typically not L5 because somehow they are very robust and they defend themselves better. L3 and L4 work really fine. So now we have a bigger amount of the same juice that we had here. But we now know that there's something in there that kills the insects. But we want to know what that is. And so that is the step where you go to the microscope. You want to look, is it virus? Is it baculovirus, meaning is it, is, is it encapsulated or not? And that is what you guys are going to look at now.